Good afternoon. Welcome to Writing While Exhausted, Creative Writing Strategies for Caregivers. My name is Caitlin Burgess, and I am the event planner for McMaster Library. Before we get started with the workshop, I want to draw your attention to the right side of your screen. During today's workshop, if you have questions at any time, please feel free to type them into the chat box. At the end of the workshop, we will have time for Jacqueline to answer them. I encourage you to type out your questions as you think of them. I would now like to introduce Jacqueline DeForge, our 2023-2024 Mabel Pew Taylor Writer in Residence. She's the queer and neurodivergent author of Danger Flower, winner of the 2022 Hamilton Literary Award for Poetry, and one of CBC's picks for the best Canadian poetry of 2021. She's also the author of Why Are You So Quiet, which was shortlisted for a Chocolate Lily Award and selected for the 2023 TD Summer Reading Club. Jacqueline is a Pushcart nominated writer and winner of a 2022 City of Hamilton Creator Award, a 2020 Hamilton Emerging Artist Award for Writing, two 2019 Short Works Prizes, and the 2018 RBC Pen Canada New Voices Award. Jacqueline's writing has been featured in literary magazines across Canada. She holds an MFA from the University of British Columbia School of Creative Writing and lives in Hamilton with her partner and daughter. Over to you, Jacqueline. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for that lovely introduction. I'm, and thank you all so much for being here. This is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, and I'm so delighted to be talking with you today about writing while exhausted. Um, I, I have some slides, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put them up now. It might just take me a second to do the whole screen sharing situation. So I would appreciate your patience for just one moment. Okay, and we're gonna share, share, we're sharing. Okay, um, I hope that you can see the slides and also see my face. Um, Caitlin, just let me know if there's any, any issues. Um, today, as I mentioned, we're talking about writing while exhausted, creative writing strategies for caregivers. Uh, we're gonna be talking about the inner and outer barriers to creative writing while you're immersed in care work, whatever that kind of care work may be. Um, we're going to talk about the cultural messaging in the world around who is and isn't a writer. Uh, we're going to talk about strategies for getting writing done as a caregiver slash tired person. Um, and I'm going to also talk about transmuting creative resistance and, and cultivating creative community. Um, but I want, to I want to invite you now to get in touch with your body compass and to listen to your somatic responses to everything that I'm saying over the course of the next hour or so. If I give a suggestion that sounds um, boring or awful or completely not applicable to your situation, your, your type of care work that you're immersed in, please don't follow that advice. Please follow your own intuition, your own internal guidance. Um, and keep, you know, pay attention to the things that I say that might be like, oh, that could be a thing like that, that kind of like, you know, excited, joyful feeling. That's what we're looking for, because ultimately this is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to, writing is supposed to be a source of joy. And I don't want to add to anybody's stress. This stuff is really hard, especially when you have a ton of responsibilities on your plate and people who you're looking after. So let's dive into it. This is me. This is me as, you know, a two-year-old in the 90s. Um, as you can see, I have been writing from the very beginning. I always wanted to be a writer in some way, um, but I never, I, I was always wondering, like, is this actually me? Could I actually be one of these people who's, who's writing? There, there was, like, even from the beginning, I remember being in grade four, and this is, you know, looking back, this is a weirdly precocious thing to think. But I remember sitting there in grade four and we just started doing creative writing in school. I used to write little stories and read them to the class and make everybody laugh. And I remember thinking to myself, what are the odds that I would want to be a writer so badly? And also that I, amidst all of the people in the world, would be able to be one. Um, which is such a strange thought, but but I think it's actually quite common. Like we, especially in our in our culture, we tend to think of a writer as being someone, you know, someone special or or different or like outside of of lived reality, and it's not really true. 
Um, but I think that blocked me for a long time. I was very, I was afraid to do this. And so I, you know, I went to high school and I wanted, I was like, oh, I want to be a, I, I wish I could be a visual artist because it seems so much more expansive. There were so many more ways to be a visual artist in the world. And when I think, when I thought about who a writer was, who a writer was in the world, I pictured uh, a middle-aged man at a desk with a cigar and bourbon. And for whatever reason, like I didn't, I obviously didn't see myself in that. Um, that wasn't what I wanted to be. So I felt in some ways set apart right from the beginning. So I danced around my dream for a very long time. Um, I did what was at the that point, the responsible thing, which was to go to journalism school. Um, and I did, I was the worst journalist in the, I was the worst reporter. I, I was awful at reporting, um, really good at writing, awful at reporting. I did my best. Um, I did ghost writing. I wrote for women's magazines. I wrote a lot of articles about coconut oil. But then when I was 25, I had my baby, my daughter, Quinn, who is now eight. And at that moment, I realized that A, I was exhausted and B, I was terrified. Um, but I needed, I needed something, like I needed something to reconnect me to myself. Um, and in some ways, that exhaustion of being up in the middle of the night with a newborn, I got so tired that I was not afraid anymore. Like it was, it was, it was like the exhaustion itself was a portal into being able to do this thing that I've been running from my whole life. Um, and then, so I did it that like, I started my creative writing practice as a new mom with a, with a tiny baby. Um, I, you know, I did a mentorship with Alessandra Nakarado, which was amazing. I, you know, I, I, uh, she was so kind and told me I was a wonderful poet when I really wasn't yet. Um, and she encouraged me to apply to my MFA, which I did and somehow got in. I, I spent only two weeks on the application because I was getting towards the deadline and Anyway, long story short, here I am. And, and I have done all of the things that I've done while being a mom. Um, and in many ways, like this, like this is exactly, this feels like exactly how it was supposed to go. My, my writing has emerged from caregiving in a way. And um, yeah, it's been, it's been a wonderful journey. So I wanna talk a little bit about the inner experience of caregiving. We all know sort of what it looks like on the outside. Um, it'll differ depending on what kind of care work we're immersed in. Maybe we're looking after kids or elderly relatives or any, but like there's all kinds of care work that the world needs, care that needs to get done in order for things to keep rolling, in order for life to continue. Um, but it can be really hard internally to make that shift to, to being a caregiver. Our locus of attention shifts away from our own bodies and towards somebody else's. We can't eat when we wanna eat. We can't sleep when we wanna sleep. We can't shower when we wanna shower. Those things can be really disconnecting and isolating. Um, it can be hard. It can be, it can be very isolating. I, when, when my daughter was a baby, we lived in this neighborhood in North York. We lived in this like tiny rental bungalow in this really, um, in this neighborhood that was filled with mansions, but no one actually lived there. It was strange. It was like walking around being completely alone, pushing the stroller around. And I was quite young too. I, I was only 25 and in Toronto, there weren't very many moms my age. Um, I found that time started to operate differently. I not only, you know, the days were very long, there was no way to just sort of like disconnect and just read or watch TV all day. Like it was like, you know, I had to be on, I had to be mothering every minute, you know? Um, but also my experience, like my relationship with time became different. I was available when other people were unavailable. I was unavailable when other people were available. The poetry readings happened at 7 p.m., you know? It, not a great time for, for a parent of a baby. Um, and I had access to time that like when other people were, were asleep, I had access to these like liminal moments, you know, sitting in bed and looking up at the moon. It was, it was, it was very strange and beautiful and weird and exhausting. And then focus changed completely as well. Not only was I being interrupted 900 times a day, um, but also just my focus, while it used to feel like a laser, it became so much more diffuse. I was constantly scanning the room for danger. I was just, I had to pay attention to so many more things at once. 
that everything I knew about being a person, about doing work, doing writing, it didn't, it didn't work anymore because my brain felt different. So as part of researching for this webinar, I looked up writing advice. Um, th this is the standard advice that is given for people who want to start creative writing. And I was blown away at how completely um, inapplicable it was this advice was to my own experience having having you know just one baby this sounds impossible to me and I can imagine that if people are immersed in even even more intense levels of caregiving this would be very very difficult um, and it could potentially be you know it could be quite intimidating there's the advice to write first thing in the morning, never mind the fact that first thing in the morning is always an emergency when you're caregiving. It's like, oh my God, this is when someone needs to be fed. This is when a bunch of things need to be happened. Maybe there's kids who need to get off to school. There's so many things. Writing isn't a peaceful, tranquil time for everybody. I don't think it's a peaceful, tranquil time for most people. Um, there's also a big emphasis on setting a goal of writing a, a particular number of words each day, hitting that word count, which is just so, so stressful, especially when you have other responsibilities um, to feel like if you don't hit a word count every day that you're not being a writer, you're not doing the work of writing. That's very, very difficult, very stressful. Um, there's also advice to read voraciously and you know there were moments in when my daughter was younger where I was able to read um, depending on like at certain phases she was napping for example and I was able to read because I ignored my laundry completely um, but on the other hand like because focus is different attention is different um, it can actually be quite difficult to read as voraciously as one might have done as a child. I read for hours and hours and hours in the 90s. There was nothing else to do. It was great. Um, it's harder when you're caregiving. It's harder when your, your focus feels different. It feels more diffuse. Um, and it can be hard to find books and it can be hard to, it can feel very stressful to get through your pile. Um, I actually saw the advice online of, of neglect everything else, um, which was so silly. Like, I, I guess if the things that you're neglecting are to, you know, you, oh, I, I'm not going to buy mustard. I forgot to buy mustard. Like, that's not that big of a deal. You can't neglect your child. You can't neglect, you know, anyone else. You're, you're, you're responsible for caring for their, their physical and emotional and mental needs. Like, you can't neglect those things. These are the most important things in the world. They can't be like. It needs to, some of these things need to actually get done for life to go on. Um, and then there's other advice, like go for a six mile walk every day. That's, you know, a very specific example, but there were a lot of rituals discussed, kind of like these arcane rituals where it's like, well, I do this and then this and then this, and then I'm ready to sit down and do my writing. And that's wonderful if you can do that. Sometimes like a few days over the past eight years, I have managed to have days like that where I've been like, well, I think I'll, I'll, I'll do this and this, and then I'll sit down and I'll be ready. But most of the time it's about grabbing those moments in between grabbing whatever moment you can. And you're not always going to be able to get something, you know, do 12 things and then do your writing. You're just going to have to do your writing. Um, Setting ambitious goals is another one. I have ambitious goals for myself and I always have. I think it's great to have ambitious goals, but I think it's also really important to stay in touch with ourselves, stay in touch with our, stay in touch with the parts of us that, um, you know, might feel overwhelmed by a really ambitious goal. What can be ambitious when you, when you have people you're caring for on the day to day, what can be ambitious is like, maybe I'm going to try and devote five minutes or 10 minutes a day or, or a few days a week to um, being with my writing that can be not only can that be like a big goal, it can be a very effective goal, you can get so much done in that time. Um, and I think that that advice to set ambitious goals can kind of Kind of direct our attention away from the fact that a lot of this work can be done in a very short period of time. I've never written more than than several hours a week over my, my entire creative writing practice. And finally, to treat writing as your nine to five, I don't want a nine to five to begin with. So I certainly don't want my writing to feel like one. And that's not not a particular goal for me, but your mileage may vary on that. All of this advice, of course, is related to the fact that 
cap like this this advice emerges from a world that's rooted in capitalism right the capitalism's vision of creative writing is that numbers go up and there are so many different activities underneath the umbrella of creative writing. There's so much that needs to get done. There's reading and thinking and dreaming and imagining. All of those things are not only like part of it, those are essential to this work. Um, but those things are not easily understood through a capitalist mindset. Uh, capitalism understands like you sit down and you write a thousand words and then the next day you write another thousand words and then you have 2000 words. That's what it understands. And un like writing ultimately is not that linear and it is not that simple and there's a lot more to it. So why is it so hard to write as a caregiver? We've touched on, you know, several of these reasons, but ultimately it comes down to there, there's outer barriers, there's systemic barriers in many cases, there's lack of space, support, time. If you don't have respite care, if you don't have um, family or friends helping, if you don't have someone with whom you can share the load of caregiving, it can be very difficult. You may not have space in your house to do that conventional advice of, oh, have a desk and have your special this and your special that and your special pen and your own office or your own area. Sometimes that's not possible at, at different points in my life. Um, you know, I had, I've always had, like, I've always made some room for myself as a creative person, but at certain points, it's been like one tiny shelf in a bookshelf or like half of a half of a shelf on there where I can put a few things, um, and time, you know, there, there's just not much time, especially when you're being interrupted 10,000 times a day. Um, but there's also inner barriers. And those are those are things that we can, you know, ideally we can do something about the outer barriers too, but the inner barriers are something that we also really need to address and we can address within ourselves because there's fear. There's the fear of, oh my God, what if I'm no good at this? There's the fear of, oh my God, what if I am good at this? What if, you know, what if this thing that I have been thinking of my entire life is like someday I'm gonna write, someday I'm gonna write. What if I try it and I discover that I'm no good at it. And I had that fear and spoiler alert, I, it was true, I was not good at it. Um, and it took me a lot of years to get to the point where I could be like, okay, I'm actually okay at this. Um, there's shame, there's the shame of being at, the, at, a, at your desk and looking at your paper, writing things down and being like, who am I to be writing? Who am I to be translating my thoughts and emotions and, and the things that I notice into words and like, taking the time to do this? Like, who am I to be to be a writer? Um, and that can tie in as well with that cultural vision of who a writer is. If you don't see your own, your own experiences reflected in other people, in the writers that you see in the world, if you don't see other writers like you, you can feel like, you know, you're, you're trying to be something you're not. Um, and then there's guilt because, in, you know, this, this is a vocation that it, ta it takes time and energy and space and, um, maybe you, maybe you feel guilty when you ask when you hire a babysitter and, and spend the money, um, on having, you know, a couple hours here or there to work on your writing. Maybe you have the opportunity to maybe go on an overnight, going on a little retreat to an Airbnb or a hotel. Maybe you feel guilty about spending the money. Maybe even if you do have people who are encouraging you, um, maybe it can still, you can still feel guilt about it. And I know that I, I definitely have had, have felt that guilt over the years. As I mentioned, you may you may not see yourself reflected in the cultural vision of who a writer is. And that can be really, that can be really hard. It can be really difficult. Um, but I think something that's very helpful for me is to, to start stripping away those cultural messages around, you know, if you take away all the stories about who a writer is or like what writing is in our society, because writing is something that happens at every time and place and every context in, in, in humanity ever. We have a particular story in our era about what that means, what it looks like to be a writer and what that means in terms of a, it being a career or a vocation. But writing is, is, is a human thing that humans do in every time and place in all sorts of different contexts. So what is the work of writing if you strip away all of those extra things, all of those stories? And what it really is, it's the transmutation of consciousness into language. It's taking the experience of being a human being, of, of being conscious in the world, of, of noticing and feeling and being, 
and then tr translating that experience into language so that it can be expressed to others. And that is something that is, you don't need, you don't need to be a man at a desk with a cigar and bourbon to do that. You don't need to be anything in particular to do that. This process of transmuting consciousness into language belongs to every human being. It belongs to all of us. And not only that, it is essential work. It is very, very important that we do this as human beings and, and you deserve to do it. And your, your perspective is valuable. So what is this process? The process of transmuting consciousness into language, it's a process of gathering and arranging. What you're gathering is everything you're noticing, all the sparkly bits of life. Maybe it's like the way the sun hits a, a pebble in the water. Maybe it's like, maybe you're doing a sensory bin with your kid. You have like a bin full of rice and, and you like dig your hand in and like those things that you notice, those experiences, those reflections you have, all of those things are incredibly valuable. And if you're going to write anything, it doesn't matter what genre, what genre you're writing. And it could be a mystery novel, could be a, a personal essay, could be a poem, could be something that doesn't exist yet you still need to gather the material from your own experience in order to arrange it into a form. So gathering is making notes for your future self. Arranging is assembling those notes into form, as I mentioned, the mystery novel, assembling those notes into, uh, into a book, into a, a collection of poetry, a collection of stories, into a picture book, whatever it is, into a form that doesn't exist that it doesn't exist yet that you're going to invent. It could be anything. Now gathering, gathering is the piece that is easier during the season of life in which you are deeply immersed in caregiving. Gathering will be easier. Gathering is also the part that, remember the slide where I was talking about capitalism and what it values and what it doesn't value. Capitalism really values arranging. Um, the, when people talk about like how to how to write, they imagine the arranging part where you're like, okay, I know what I'm saying and now I'm getting it down. I'm getting those words down. I'm arranging them. I'm sending them off to publishers. It's that external part. The gathering is essential. It is 50% of it. It is very, very important, um, but it's the dreaming and imagining and making notes and thinking and reflecting and all of those things. And, and so my recommendation, and this is what I did when I was most immersed in caregiving, gathering was, was more, more of the thing that I was doing. And it kind of worked out because that really needs to be done before you arrange. So there are actually a lot of creative opportunities within caregiving, especially with that gathering part. Um, I found that the exhaustion and boredom of, of um, being a primary caregiver was actually like kind of the perfect context within, you know, to be able to be gathering. I was very aware at every moment of what was going on. I was doing a lot of walking. I was doing a lot of, you know, like, I was just very present in every moment. And that's exactly what you need when you're gathering, you know, um, you have, as a caregiver, you also have a deep connection to what matters as a human being. You're immersed in, in very, very important work that needs to be done in order for life to keep rolling. Um, and it's work that is often devalued, but it is essential. You have a deep connection, not only to what matters, but you have a deep connection to matter, to physical life, to like making food and, and like doing the laundry and like all of that physical stuff. Those rich sensory details are exactly what you need in order to make your writing feel alive. And then again, and just access to those liminal times, right? Access to um, those, those times of day when everyone else is asleep or those times of day when everyone else is at work. Um, those can be wonderful times to be doing a little bit of gathering here and there. Okay, so I'm going to talk about strategies for gathering while exhausted. Um, the thing about gathering is you still need to find the time to do it. It still needs a container in which it can, it can be done. Um, some people do well at just like any, any given moment. Like if there's, you know, 
if there's any time in which you're waiting, even five minutes, they'll just, you know, get their notebook out and scribble some things down or they'll get their notes app out on their phone. Great. For me, it's harder because it's, it's hard to do that. I, I don't necessarily do that. Um, I like it. I, I find it easier if I, if I link in some ways, like, if I link gathering or writing to a habit I already have, I really like coffee window time because I'm so addicted to coffee that there is never going to be a day in which there is no coffee. Like there will be coffee no matter what is going on. There will be coffee. So if I attach writing in some capacity to coffee, then I know a little bit of writing is going to go on. I find that coffee window time is that's a time where I sit and I look out the window and I drink coffee and I set a timer for 10 minutes and I'm not really writing, but I'm making notes of just anything that bubbles up within me, any like thoughts that I have or images that, you know, could potentially go into a poem later. Um, so if you set a time with yourself, I would recommend like a length of time that feels really good to your inner, you know, body compass. Like if I say 10 minutes and that sounds overwhelming, like go back to go five minutes, go one minute, scale it back to the length of time that doesn't feel scary. Um, you can get a lot done in one minute. If you write for one minute a day, you will eventually have a lot of writing done. Um, so that's, that's how you sort of like find a way to insert that process into your life. In terms of how you actually, like, how are you going to collect this stuff? How are you going to, you're going to be making notes. You're going to have like lines here or there. You're going to have different descriptions or fragments of language. Something that I really like um, as a practice to connect it to reading is the commonplace book. Um, I don't know if you've heard of this, but it, it's basically a book. It was very popular in Victorian times, but it's a notebook where when you're reading other books and you notice a line or a quote that is meaningful to you, you will write it out by hand in your own commonplace book. And then that book becomes a, essentially a collection of, of quotes that are meaningful to you. This is very pleasant to do. It's very nice to have your notebook. And, you know, then if you read a page or two out of your book, you can you can be like, oh, okay. And you, you know, you write down a sentence and then you really feel like you're accomplishing something. And you actually are accomplishing something. Having a commonplace book filled with quotes that are meaningful to you, that is so valuable in terms of a writing practice. That is so like one day you may have to put a quote at the beginning of a poem or beginning of your book. When you're flipping through your commonplace book, it's essentially like it's a collection of things that matter to you. You'll be able to see going through your commonplace book, what it is that, um, that is really meaningful to you. And you're going to be connecting to other writers by, by like working on this collection over time. So if that sounds fun, I really recommend it. If that doesn't sound fun, do not do it. Don't do anything that's not fun because just why don't, don't do that. Um, another suggestion I have when I was doing, doing this kind of gathering writing, when my daughter was a baby, um, I, I like, I don't write by hand. Generally I have terrible handwriting and my brain just moves way faster than my hand does. So I type, um, but I would, I would open a new file, like a new Microsoft Word file, and I would write a bunch of stuff. And then the next day I would open a different one and then I would open a different one. And eventually I just had hundreds of files that had were just, it was too overwhelming to go through. So a lot of it, I just never looked at again. I really recommend when you're in this gathering state of mind, just have one file or one notebook, like one digital file could be, or one physical file where you're putting blank, like, pages into or a notebook, just one notebook. But even if you're writing about different topics, if you're writing different different fragments of different stories or different poems, keeping it all in one place can really give you a good visual representation of everything that you're getting done. You'll see those that page count going up. It may not end up being like a complete book in the end. It may be a bunch of different fragments. But you're still getting a lot done. And psychologically, it can just be helpful if it's all in one place. Um, some people feel 
myself included, feel intimidated by very pretty notebooks. Um, maybe it's because I have terrible handwriting, um, but I always feel like I'm messing up the notebook and I, and I tend to like, you know, I'll write something and then I'll look at it again and be like, oh, I don't want that anymore. And if I rip it out, then there'll be clearly no page, like their page will be gone. They'll be, you know, so I find the chiller you can make the notebook situation, the easier it will be in terms of your writing. So that means you could have like a wire bound notebook if you wanted, but I like the DIY option of my favorite, my absolute favorite paper to write on is, is just like blank white printer paper. Um, and if you get a couple of binder clips, then you can just add more pages, add more of this white printer paper into this binder clip. And eventually it becomes like a notebook and you can also move things around. You can, you can take out things you don't want anymore. You can rearrange stuff. Um, and you're also tricking your mind into thinking that you're not doing, it's not, it's no big deal. You're not doing anything serious here because you're just, it's just your chill notebook. It's not, not a big deal. Another thing that I really like is the idea of having, having like a box and index cards. So index cards are just so lovely to write on. I don't know if it's the fact that it's like, it's like that thicker, like cardstock paper, or maybe just like with the size of it, it's small. So it doesn't feel like you're doing anything stressful. Um, and it feels okay to even just write one line on an index card and have that be it. So that's fine. Um, if you get a pretty photo box and a pile of index cards, A, you can leave various piles of index cards around your house so that if, you know, in at whatever moment you think of something, maybe you're washing the dishes and then, oh, I thought of something, you grab an index card and there's a pen there. And then later you just toss it in your photo box. Eventually you'll have a photo box filled with index cards that are filled with your thoughts and feelings and observations. Um, and that can ultimately turn into an outline for an act like a book or, or like another piece of writing. Um, something that I have recently started working on is um, texting myself. Because I find that when I think of something, my first instinct is to text it to somebody. Um, and that doesn't always work. Because if I'm like texting ideas to different people, that, like the idea is going into different chats and it doesn't get saved in one place. Um, but I got this app recently called Kept. It's Q-E-P-T. Um, and it allows you to text yourself essentially. Um, and so now I have this like chat with myself where I can just throw things as I think of them. Um, I've also read about people doing like starting an email account just for their for their writing. Um, so you can email yourself your writing and then eventually the inbox is going to fill up with your with your your bits of writing and that's again it's that collection getting bigger and bigger. So those are all strategies that you can use. Um, and in terms of like how do you actually know what to write when you get there when you get to the blank page, um, I really recommend prompts. I, I have been facilitating writing workshops for years that involve like sitting around the table together and writing to prompts. And I'm always amazed at how effective they can be at, at like helping us pull, like tease out what it is we really want to say. Sometimes the focus of a prompt can be really helpful. Um, so I have some prompts here that might be might be interesting to you. And again, following that body compass, if any of these don't sound fun, don't bother. But if any of them like give you a sense of like, oh, okay, it could be something to look into. What is beautiful in this moment? Writing is so much about the truth. Even if your writing is not like, even if you're, you're like the craft of writing, you still have, you still have stuff to learn. If you're being emotionally authentic in your writing, whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction or whatever it is, if you're tuning in with the reality of how you're feeling, it's going to be so much more powerful. And so what I like about the prompt, what is beautiful in this moment is that if you're looking at you, like you may look around your house and just see like everything's a complete disaster. And your first thought may be, well, there's nothing beautiful here but there's always something beautiful here. 
and there's there's a certain kind of beauty in that in that kind of love right of like the messy house of like this is this is what I'm doing this is how I'm this is how I'm living my life I'm taking care of the people I love um so attuning to beauty whether that's like you know, maybe you notice something on your shelf that you haven't noticed before. Maybe there's a seashell that you forgot you got at the beach last year and you can write about the seashell. Um, maybe you find a kind of beauty in the pile of dirty laundry on the ground. Maybe you're able in that moment to see beauty in that. And that's something to write about as well. What is true in this moment is also, you know, just going back to that sense of like, how do you be emotionally authentic in your writing? So much of writing is about getting past that initial impulse to try to appear to the reader, even the imaginary reader at that point, trying to appear to the reader as in some way like smart or or like um, wise or artistic or artsy or whatever it is. We want to appear in those like as as like writers, like whatever that is, however we view that in ourselves. And the more I can, I find that the more I connect to my actual truth of how I'm actually feeling in this moment, like this is me being a writer in this messy situation, whatever it is, it makes my writing so much stronger. So finding truth there is, is so essential. So like have, you know, write about truth, whether, even if that's like the, what's true in this moment is I don't want to be writing. What's true in this moment is I am exhausted. Write that down. Even if it's one line, what is the current quality of light? Um, you can't describe light without in some way, re like get accessing some kind of metaphor or poetic language, um, connecting with the quality of light in the room can really help you ground yourself, bring yourself into the present moment. Um, that could be one that you do every day. Every day you could see if the quality of light is different. Do that for a week. Um, back to the truth stuff, what am I avoiding within myself? One of the reasons we don't wanna sit down and write necessarily is because um, sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it hurts in there. Sometimes there's feelings in there that we don't want to acknowledge you know, and just the, the, the final prompt on this page is, is why aren't I writing? And that's another good question to ask in that regard. You may not be writing because you're afraid. You may not be writing because you don't want to sit, you don't want to be alone with yourself. Um, and that's something very important to acknowledge. Even if you can't fix it in that moment, you can't necessarily, you know, solve all the issues in one moment. Acknowledging that is really important. And then getting back to those sensory details. What did you taste, smell, see, hear, touch today? the more you can be in your body, in your writing, not being up here in your mind, thinking of brilliant um, conceptual things to say, but like, what is, what is actually happening? What are you experiencing? What is your consciousness experiencing? What are you experiencing being in this body? That is what makes writing strong. Strategies for arranging while exhausted. So, I do more arrange now arranging, as I mentioned before, is when you take all of those little sparkly bits that you gather and you put them in order and it becomes a form. Um, this is the stuff that requires like more like logical thinking. Um, this is the stuff that, that the conventional advice is more talking about, but there are still ways to do it within the context of caregiving. Um, one thing that can be really helpful is to one part of the process that I really like is when you go through all of the, like the notes that you've left for yourself and you try and find the ones, find the ones that you want to use. And the way that, you know, whether you should be arranging those pieces is like, you go through it and you use that body compass and you use that sense of like, oh, this feels like this feels sparkly. This feels like something and you highlight that, or you put it in a pile, you do whatever it is that you do to separate it out from the rest. And you, and you, you, you can save the rest, but you don't need to arrange it necessarily. Um, this is the work of, you need to have a container. You need to have a container of time. You need to have a container of space. 
Um, and you need to have within your writing a container in which to arrange the, the, the bits you've gathered. Um, so ways that I have done this, timed sessions I find are absolutely essential to me. I, if I am assessing at every moment during my writing time, well, am I doing, am I getting anything done? I'll just stop. I've done enough for now. It doesn't work. I need to just open a container and that can be 10 minutes. It can be 60 minutes. It can be three hours. I would never, I can never do more than that um, in one day, but you can get so much done in 10 minutes, 10 minutes of sitting and arranging the things that you have already gathered. Um, that means like looking at the notes you've made, sitting down and like figuring out like, okay, what goes where? Like, this is the, this is the, the, that kind of writing, you know, um, you can get so much done in 10 minutes. You can get a lot done in 60 minutes. Three hours is like luxurious. Um, but don't worry if you can't schedule three hours, like even if you schedule three hours once every six months, that would be amazing. If you could um, get some respite care, get a family or a family member, a friend to help. Um, if you can do once a year, once every five years, what, depending on the situation, if you can do an overnight or, or a weekend retreat, um, that's what I did with danger flower was I, I did, I think my daughter was in, was in junior kindergarten. I had a little bit of time when I was doing the majority of the gathering for that book. Um, but at the end, I had a big pile of poems that needed to be edited and needed to be arranged. So I, I did a, a self-directed residency at Gibraltar Point in Toronto, on Toronto Island. Um, it was like two nights and I got the book all arranged in that context. I know like that is a very, like not everyone has access to that, but there are ways to get it done. It can even happen in your own home. If there's some way, if you can find a family or friend, family member or friend to help you um, with your caregiving, if you can be alone in your house overnight, it can be really, really helpful um, to take that time, have that, that container of space and time, that longer one, which is like no more than like three days, maybe you can get so much done in that time. Um, I sort of skipped over this, this at the beginning, but turtle steps are so important. It can be very intimidating to declare like, okay, now I'm going to sit down and do my, my arranging. I'm going to arrange this into a novel. Like, oh my gosh, that is stressful. So the turtle step, the first step of doing that though, is to open a word processing file, like open a Microsoft word file, save it as novel and then close it, you know, or you can say, well, this is my 10 minute novel writing container. And you can sit at your desk and open that file and just look at it and just sit there for 10 minutes. And then your timer goes off and you're done. That is valuable. It's just about, it's about getting like taking that time, taking that space to be with it and then check mark. Then, then that's it. You're, you're, you did it. Um, and really validating yourself that that is, that is very good that you did it. Um, and just getting that, getting that check, check mark done. The, the pleasant transitions can be very helpful. I use this app called Endel, which is, uh, you don't need to use this particular app. It just plays like ambient music and it has a timer. Um, but I have a particular ambient music track that I play when I'm working on my book. Um, and I put on a timer for an hour. If it's a very luxurious day, I will put on a timer for, for two or three hours. Um, and then I feel like even if I'm just sitting and daydreaming and just being there, eventually I'll get bored and I'll type something, you know, stuff really gets done. If you, if you, if you create that container, um, and then also using form to your advantage. Um, this is another topic for another day, but there are, there are forms out there that other people have already created. There, there is advice online about like how to write a picture book. Well, by this page, you need this to happen by this page. You need this, this to happen. You need a character. You need this, you need this. There's beat sheets where it says, well, this needs to happen. Then this needs to happen. Then this needs to happen. And that makes a story. And as a writer of like weird literary stuff, I have rebelled against this at every step of the way, but I'm now starting to really, really value 
the fact that those forms already exist, those containers already exist that, that we can put our sparkly stuff in that we've gathered that we've worked so hard to gather you don't need to reinvent the wheel um and it's and it's like it's a really good idea to look into the form of whatever kind of piece of writing you want to be writing how to transmute creative resistance this creative resistance is the inner part of yourself that when you do have time when you do have space you could be writing, um, but you don't want to for some reason. And, the, and it's this voice in your head that'll tell you like, well, I really should do the laundry or I really should do this, or I really should phone this person, or, you know, I'm writing historical fiction and I really should, you know, research every single instance of this historical thing happening in the history of humanity. Like it'll say all kinds of different stuff. And this is different from actual like external barriers. Um, and it's even different than fear. It's this, it's this part that is like, that is distressed. You know, it's this distress that makes it really difficult to transition from not writing to writing. Um, I will tell you that in many ways, it was a lot harder for me to write. It was harder for me to get writing done when I had a kid in school and a grant than it was when I was writing in the margins of my life. There is something about having a lot of time that actually makes it really scary and difficult um, to get to actually get things done because it's this voice that's like, oh my God, no, wait, like we can't do this. It's because if you sit down and you start doing it, you might notice that you're not happy with what you're writing, you know, um, or maybe there's something else. The key with creative resistance is to be with it and to attune your attention to it to notice it and listen to it because the way creative resistance wins is it sneaks up on you and tells you that you should be like sorting the mail right now right so if you turn to it and you say oh you're telling me to sort the mail right now that's interesting then you're looking it directly in the eyes and then it, it loses its power right um so once upon a time in university, I had to take a creative writing course, or sorry, not creative writing. I had to take an acting course. I had to, I had to act. It was, it was silly, but I had to do it. Um, and one of the things that we had to do as our, you know, as for our project was, was like, we had to stand in front of the class and read something out loud. And looking back now, this was a very good class for me to have taken. It was absolutely essential to my current job, but I did not know that at the time. And it was very shy and very terrified. Um, but what I learned was the best way to move through that fear of standing in front of everybody and being on stage and you know, having to read something is to actually be in the moment. And the teacher had us, like when we were up there, we had to look in everybody's eyes and just stand there silently until we until we'd like got comfortable with that feeling of resistance. And then when we started, when I started reading, the the advice was like find enjoyment in every word, like try and find something enjoyable within it. And I did, I found so much enjoyment in, in like, in reading the words out loud. And now reading poetry is my favorite part of my creative practice. Like when I get to do a poetry reading, I'm so happy. Um, you can, if you sit with that resistance, that discomfort, that is like, um, it's like you're lining up for a roller coaster, right? And you're like, you know, the line's moving forward and you're getting there and you're like, oh my God, I feel nervous. That's what it feels like before you get started. So if you find at the root of your fear, like the desire to write, the desire and the, the enjoyment of writing, then it can be easier to move through, move through that resistance because it's so hard. It's so, it can be really scary to do this. Um, something else that's so important is cultivating a creative community and you know, when I talk to people as part of my, uh, my writer in residencing, um, a lot of people talk about how they wish they had access to some kind of writing group. And, and like that really in many ways is like the holy grail of like, oh my gosh, I, I would be so great to have like a group of writers who, who really get along and are writing, you know, similar things or are helpful to each other in some way. And it can be really difficult to find um, 
but it can be done. And if you put feelers out, you may find even in, even in the communities that you're already in as a caregiver, there may be people who like a lot of people enjoy writing and a lot of people have creative aspirations who you might not even realize do. So, so reaching out and trying to arrange something like that, especially now with Zoom, there's so much more access to, to, to um, connection in that way. You can meet with people all around the world, um, but you don't necessarily need like that would, that is great, especially if you can find people who p- potentially will switch off on like babysitting or like helping with other caregiving responsibilities or who will, will help you in some way um, to get your writing done or to edit your writing or to give you advice. Um, but even if you can't access in your current life and the way things are right now, it's just, it doesn't make sense. You can't access those like people, you know, in that way, you can develop your own metaphysical writing community like you can have a sense of community reading authors who are long dead um you can have a sense of community like like i cannot tell you how how deeply connected i feel to like charlotte bronte for example um i see myself in jane eyre so much and and like i see myself in so many women writers throughout history who in many like in most cases were were writing in situations that were not supportive to their writing um I see that and I, and I feel connected to those people. And so you can sort of develop your own, your own like metaphysical connections. Maybe you can have a collection of the, of those, those people's books and maybe you can, you can read their diaries or maybe you can like, you can have a sense of community through time and space, you know? And I think that that can be really valuable if you, if you stay connected to the fact that you as a human being are doing something that humans have been doing from the dawn of time transmuting that consciousness into language you don't have to feel so alone because you're really not you are so connected you're so connected to everyone who's ever done this and so connected to everyone who's ever been deeply immersed in the difficult daily reality of caregiving so i would just assure you that you're not alone and also there are ways to do you know people will often recommend like for networking it's like go to poetry readings go to this go to that you can do that. And especially now with Zoom, it's more possible. Um, I've been able, you know, since the pandemic, I've been able to go to way more events because even now my kid is older, it's still hard for me to get out and go to something at 7 p.m. I am tired by 7 p.m. Um, so you can you can find like things to go to and stuff like that, but you can get a lot of networking done just reading people's books and writing them a, a thank you note. I've done so much networking just by thanking people Um, I remember when I was like really in the thick of it with the toddler, um, I read, I read Shannon Bramer, uh, Shannon Bramer's book of poetry called Precious Energy. And it's all about mothering. Um, and it really touched me. And in that case, I didn't even send her an email. I just, you know, I took a picture of myself of like holding myself, holding the book. And then in the background was my complete disaster master of a living room and I just wrote you know a comment about how much the book meant to me and I tagged her um and it was so wonderful and like we got to to chat a little bit and and um I I admire her so much and I still I love her work so there are ways to connect to other writers no matter what's going on um and um yeah most of us are introverts so it's okay it's okay to write and to, to like connect in letter form Writing is a lifelong vocation. I just want to make that really clear. This is not something that needs to get done in a year or five years. This is this is not Olympic figure skating. You're not there's no like aging out. Like you're you can do this forever. Like as long as you're as long as you're here, you can do this. And and there's a lot of time. Um you have so many opportunities over time and and maybe in this season, you're doing more gathering, maybe in another season of life, you'll be doing more arranging. Um, But also I just want to validate everyone for a, how challenging it is and B like to validate your creative dreams. Like the fact that you want to write is so valuable and the world needs it so much. Um, And it's also okay to like take a nap you know, it's okay to, instead of writing, to decide, you know what, I'm really tired. I'm going to use this time. I have this babysitter. I'm just going to sleep. If you are really, really tired, like you should sleep. That's exactly what you need in that moment. Um, And 
and yeah, writing is wonderful and you can, you can do it and you will get it done. It's also like, it's not the most important thing in every single moment. There are other things that are more important. Um, and I've read so much advice, which is like, well, if you, if you don't think about writing as soon as you wake up and think about it again, as soon as you go to sleep and think about it all day and obsess about it, then are you really a real writer? I don't know, but I, I have other things to think about and the things that are most important in my life are the people that I love. There's nothing more important to me than that. And over time I have prioritized my relationships more and that is exactly what I should be doing. And I'm happy about that. Um, as much joy as writing gives me, I the, like the love in my life is so much more important. So anyway, um, I would also encourage you to make an appointment with me, seeing as I am now, I'm, I'm doing this writer in residence thing until the end of April. Um, the link is here if you would like to book an appointment. I would love to chat with you. The appointments are 45 minutes long and we can, you can bring in writing for me to look at if you like, but we can also just chat about your individual circumstances, strategies that you may need in order to get writing done. Um, and I and I would love to chat with you and appointments can happen either here at McMaster or um, at HPL, Central Library, downtown Hamilton, or they can happen over Zoom. Um, and if you have any questions, you can also you can also email me. Um, and yeah, I, I would love to hear your questions now if, if any have come in, Caitlin. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Um, so yeah, just as a reminder, um, there is a chat box on the right hand side of your screen. Um, I'm probably pointing the wrong way. Uh, <laughs> um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to send them in. Um, one question we did get, and just so you know, lots of praise and people agreeing with a lot of the things that you're saying, um, I'll make sure that you see these comments after. Um, but one question came in, how do we know when it's time to move from gathering to arranging? That is a really, really wonderful question. I, I think that the time, like how you know when it's time is that you'll start to get annoyed. Like I think that anger or frustration is actually a really good indicator of time that like change needs to be made. And I don't mean like you need to be enraged at your writing or something, but there's this feeling that can come up. That's like, that's like, I'm annoyed with this. Like what's wrong. Something's not working. I've been doing this for so long and I don't know what's next. Like, what do I do? Like that kind of, it's the energy of like, when, when I was still walking my daughter back and forth in order to like, get her to go to sleep at night. And I would walk her back and forth for half an hour. And I did that, you know, until one day I was like, no, we are not doing this anymore. Cause I'm going to fall down. And then it's like, no, you're going in, in the room. You're going like, you're, you're going to lear learn to lie down and go to sleep yourself. It's like that kind of thing, right? You will know when the moment comes when you're like, this is, this is the time I want to move forward. And in that moment you will be like, okay, how do I do this? And that's when you, that's when you figure out how do you, how you're going to create your containers. So that container can be, um, 10 minutes a day. It can be 10 minutes a week. It can be one hour a week. It can be, um, setting up, um, Oh, Pat. So Pat Schneider, she's the author of writing alone and with others, which is a wonderful book. I highly recommend she writes, I think she had four kids and she was right. She wrote in that book about how she would do an annual writing retreat. She would go away and, uh, write on her own for, for like a, a few days or whatever, or maybe it was a whole week. And she would write about the first two days. She just slept. It was just sleeping. And then, and then she was able to finally do her writing. Um, but yeah, you'll, you'll know the moment cause you'll get annoyed and you'll be ready to create those containers for yourself. Excellent. Um, another question has come in. What if I'm tired all the time? Do you have advice about getting around the fatigue of caregiving to access creativity? Yeah. Well, you know, like sometimes it is so tiring and I am not, I, I will never suggest to anyone that like, if you are that exhausted and you have the opportunity to lie down that you should choose writing instead. I think you should go to sleep if at all possible. Um, sleeping is so essential and dreaming is part of writing, you know? So, so 
prioritize your physical health. If you are that tired all the time, like try to sleep. If you know, if you still want to do some writing, um, like within that tiredness, tiredness actually isn't the worst thing, especially for the gathering part of writing. Tiredness can be sort of like, um, it can, it can make you feel like you're not entirely, um, your logical mind can sort of be sleeping and your subconscious can kind of pop up like images and stuff can pop up. So I would say like, if you're in that situation where you are so overwhelmed and so tired all the time, like just put an index card by your bed. And if you write, when you wake up, like if you write down an image from a dream or just the first image that pops into your head and it's one line, that's actually very valuable. That's very valuable to have, especially if you're, if you're writing your dreams down, because though that's filled with symbolism. And when you go back to it at a later time, when maybe you can get away for for a, a, an overnight or a few days or a week, oh my goodness, that would be like, whoa. Um, you'll go back and be like, oh, there's a lot in there. Like there's a lot that can be teased out of a dream image. Um, and also just, I just wanna validate the tiredness because it is really hard. Yeah. I'm just wondering for those who are local and you're from Hamilton, is there a spot like that you've gone to for the weekend that you have, or for one night that you have just found like kind of inspiring and has kind of helped you in your writing? Um, I have, I have been known to rent an Airbnb once in a while. Um, Hamilton has quite inexpensive Airbnbs, or at least it did last time I looked, I don't know what's, what's going on. Um, lately um but that could be an option also coffee shops I really like um Durand coffee shop um in the Durand neighborhood and there's so many so many lovely coffee shops Westdale is great you could go to um you go to King West Books and then go to Paisley Cafe and get some writing done sitting in a park is great especially if you're if you're um, if your kid or kids are at the age where you can sort of sit in one place, sit on a picnic blanket and let them run off for a bit, um, that's a great place to be just making notes, scribbling things down. Um, yeah, lots, lots of wonderful places around here. Great. Um, okay. And I guess, uh, I think last question is, is there something that you're currently working on that you want to share and anyone's yeah. curious? <laughs> Sure. So I am, I am writing a novel very slowly. Um, I've been prioritizing, you know, getting, getting everything going with the residency and making sure that I, that I have all of, all had the launch done and had, you know, that I'm available for everybody. Um, but I'm working on a novel. That's my like new, I try to always have both a, a, an arranging project and the gathering project because they're two different ways of being ways of writing so my current gathering project is um is my is my novel that I'm and it is just such a delight like because I've been arranging for so long my short story collection which is almost almost like it's mostly done I'm just like tweaking these last few things um, but so that's what I'm working on with arranging that's a my collection my short story collection is a book I've been working on for for about five years um, and the novel is brand new and so delicious. It's so nice, um, especially after writing all those stories, it's nice to just write one story instead of 13. Anyway, I'm sure it'll get harder later, but I'm having a great time right now. That makes sense. Okay, well, thank you everyone for questions. I would like to thank Jacqueline for this incredible workshop and to all of you for registering. I'd also like to extend a thank you to Colin from the Faculty of Humanities for running our tech support behind the scenes today. Um, and just so you know, a recording of this workshop will be available in the coming days, and I will send the link out when it's ready. Or if you know someone who wanted to attend and couldn't, um, not to worry, because there will be a recording. Um, thank you so much, Jacqueline, and have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone.